Let me start by thanking all the organizers and Bishops University. You've all been, uh, you know, wonderful. Um, you've welcomed us very well, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And uh, it really is, uh, it's kind of fun to be back in Quebec. And it's the first time I've been to Bishops University, but uh, if the experience I've had is representative, then you're very lucky, the students that, that are here. It seems like a really gr great group of people. So um, I would like to start by um, t making sort of three general points about my talk. I want to talk about my talk and tell you what I'm going to do. And um, then we'll get down to the content. The first thing, um, the first thing I'd like to say is that I'm a philosopher. I teach in, um, in the liberal arts. And I want to make a case for liberal arts education. So I want to say that liberal arts education, it's not um, history for history's sake. It's not antiquarianism. It's not a cabinet of curiosities. It's something that's relevant today, right now. Um, as a philosopher, what I specialize in is particularly Aristotle. But what you find is when you go back to ancient periods, you find ideas, thoughts, arguments, principles that are relevant right now, that make sense right now, and that we have mostly in our culture forgotten. And I see my job a little bit as rehabilitating, retrieving these ideas to help us live better lives. Now, because this was um, the, the theme of the, uh, of the week was uh, mental health among students, I'm not going to talk, I want to stress that, about mental illness, but I want to talk rather about the rough and tumble of everyday life, uh, the vicissitudes, the ups and downs that we all experience. And I want to go back to ancient Greek philosophy, particularly to the Stoics, and I want to show you that there's wisdom there that we've forgotten about, and that perhaps even we can disagree with, but there's something there that we should pay attention to. And so I'm going to give you a little course um, on ancient Greek Stoicism. The third point I want to make before starting the talk, I was very happy last night Dr. Goldblum mentioned the big fat Greek wedding, the movie, and as he put it, the uh, father of the protagonist in the movie, he's a very proud Greek, and he's convinced that uh, every word in the English language um, comes from Greek, of course. And uh, because I'm back in Quebec, la belle province, I feel I should say that every word in French as well comes uh, from Greek. <laughs> certainly, sometimes I think in philosophy, certainly every word, or at least every second word, um, that we talk about, that we use the vocabulary to explain deep issues comes from Greek. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to go through a few Greek words and explain uh, what they mean and try to get a handle on what uh, the ancient Greek Stoics thought about dealing with hardship, adversity in life. I think today we might say that it's a matter of dealing with stress in life, but in any case, um, that's what I want to talk about. Now, the title was uh, my, The Ancient Greek Art of Minding Your Own Business. The ancient Greeks actually did not like busybodies. And Aesop talks about this. And Aesop tells a tale about somebody um, sort of proving that somebody's a busybody and interfering in other people's business. That's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about the, the title of the uh, conference was Mindfulness and Education. I want to talk about minding your own business in the sense that each person is unique. Each person has a set of talents and a set of opportunities that they can be vigilant about, that they can be conscientious about in order to accomplish something meaningful in their lives. So mindfulness here means being vigilant. And minding your own business really means that you have some kind of business that you are supposed to be about. And if we look back at the Stoics, we really find a very rich tradition that helps us go about the business of minding our own business. I'm not going to emphasize this, but I thought I should 
sort of click us in or, or fit us into history, these are three important figures in the Stoic tradition. Zeno of Citium, who is credited with starting Stoicism. Epictetus, who's probably the most important Stoic, um, was a Roman slave. And I have to point out, it's not a very good picture of, it's not a good picture of him because he didn't write anything. He was a Roman slave who was allegedly beaten by his master and turned into a cripple and basically learned to um, master life in such an admirable way that he was set free and he became a philosopher and set up his own school. Uh, he did, his student, Arian, wrote down his lectures, so basically wrote lecture notes, um, and that's one of the main texts we have when we study Stoicism. And the final gentleman is Marcus Aurelius, the emperor who wrote the meditations. And I think, in a way, what's most important about this slide is notice the dates. That's what I'm talking about. About 500 years, uh, 300 years before Christ, 200 years uh, AD. Uh, basically, in that period, we, what we call in philosophy, Hellenistic philosophy, um, we have this flourishing of a number of different schools, one of them Stoicism. What happens is philosophy becomes practical. It becomes a matter of practical ethics. It's not so much a matter of metaphysics, although the Stoics had metaphysical beliefs. It's not as much a matter of, um, of logic, although again the Stoics had an interesting logic. But first and foremost, it's a matter of figuring out how to live your life. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of the terms they use and try to understand what they mean. And I'll leave it to you to figure out if uh, you think that they're relevant to the predicament we all find ourselves in. The first term is logos, which is just the Greek word for reason. It's actually quite a complex word. It's where we get our word logic. And the first point I want to make is that the Stoics said that logic wasn't just a matter of thinking, it was a matter of doing. So it had a practical application. What you had to do as a human being, because they believed that human beings were particular and that they were rational animals, what you had to do was not simply talk about things in a consistent or a logical way, but you had to live your life in a logical way. So Epictetus at one point says, and this is in Roman times, so we're really talking about Greek and Roman philosophy, but um, uh, this is Roman times, it's very important when you go out to a banquet, you know how to have proper manners and proper etiquette. Epictetus says, when you go to a banquet, don't talk about how you should eat at a banquet, eat as you ought. And the idea is that Logic, we might almost uh, translate it as intelligence. Intelligence is something should, that should pervade, that should permeate, not just our speaking, not just our writing, but the actual way we live our lives. The second word is apatheia. And this uh, is a Greek word, you recognize it. Looks like the, um, the English word apathy. And in fact, it means without passion or without pathos, without feeling. Now, it's not that the Stoics didn't think you should have feelings. They thought it was important to have the appropriate feelings. But the problem with trying to be intelligent about life, trying to be logical, is that oftentimes our feelings get in the way. So think of the mind like a window. What happens is feelings fog the window so that we can't see what the world really is. The idea to, or the, the, the way, the solution to having a, a good life, a successful life, is to see the way things really are and to act accordingly. What happens with feelings, if we let them get out of hand, is feelings push us in certain directions. Rather than believing that the world is as it really is, we believe that it is the way we want it to be. And feelings have a way of being self-serving. We, we have a, a tendency to practice favoritism, to always rearrange things uh, if we go by our feelings so that uh, they privilege us. And so what you need to do 
if you're going to um, uh, be successful in life, the first thing you have to do is you have to have a clear window in your mind. You have to have a transparency that you can go out and see, leave your feelings behind and understand the world as it really is. Third word is atarkeia, which means self-sufficiency or self-reliance. For the Stoics, who often talked about philosophy as a therapy, the goal of life, well, I'll talk about the goal of life in a moment. I won't get ahead of myself. But the, the important thing to notice is that if you want to be happy, I assume we all want to be happy, if you make your happiness depend on things outside yourself, then you put yourself in a very vulnerable position. Epictetus says at the beginning of, uh, um, of the, his little handbook, uh, we have to distinguish between things that are inside our power and things that are outside our power. The things outside your power, you can't change. The things inside your power, you can change. And things inside our power are things like attitudes, beliefs, uh, decisions, everything that relates to the way we decide to live our lives. The Stoics believe that many, many people are unhappy. Why? Because they focus on things outside their control. They want them to be different, and it just leads to frustration. It leads to disillusionment, to disappointment. Why? Because they're outside of our control. So what we have to do is we have to learn to be self-reliant. We have to find the source of happiness, the source of um, meaning within ourselves and not be dependent on what's outside of ourselves. So for example, if you're somebody and what you like is to be complimented by other people, the Stoics would say, just a minute here. You want, what makes you happy is that you're complimented by other people. You can't control that. Anybody who's lived long enough knows that there are times when you act in a praiseworthy way. You ought to be complimented, but you're not. Because that's just the way the world is. Merit is not always recognized. And if you live your life hankering after, you know, the, the, the compliments of people that you have no control over, you're going to inevitably be disappointed. You're going to be sad. You're not going to, uh, uh, you're not going to be focusing on the right thing, which is merit. So basically what you need to do is you need to focus on this. This is arete. This is the Greek word for virtue. And I want to talk about it at a little bit of length. Uh, it's associated particularly with Aristotle, and Aristotle has a virtue ethics. The important thing is that this notion of virtue is very different than our notion of morality. We have a notion of morality where morality is thou shalt not. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not, so on and so forth. This is a much more positive notion of uh, morality, and pretty much all the ancient Greek philosophers um, sort of uh, believed in this and, and, and focused on this. The idea here is self-actualization. So what morality involves is human thriving. It's human flourishing. Yes, we need some rules, some laws about what we can't do, but mostly what we should be trying to do is we should be trying to be the best we can be with our opportunities, with our talents, um, within the restrictions in which we, for whatever reason, find ourselves within. What we need to try to do is develop our talents and be the best we can be. Now, one of the great things about this notion of morality is that its morality is linked intimately to a notion of self-esteem. So that what happens is, is that when human beings do good things, or great things, or, or patient things, or loving things, or compassionate things, or things that they think are right, they inevitably feel more self-esteem. And um, basically the Stoics, what they want to say is, you focus on yourself, you become self-reliant, and what do you focus on? Um, you focus on, first of all, uh, virtue, 
doing what's meritorious. And that sense of self-esteem that you get from arete will lead to the next word, ataraxia. Ataraxia, it means literally unperturbedness. Think of a, you've got a, a pond and you throw a rock in the pond and it creates a bunch of ripples. That is the opposite of ataraxia. Ataraxia is the pond when it's perfectly still. Now, what I want you to notice is that in our society, we emphasize happiness, but we confuse happiness with exaltation, with intense, intense feelings, with great success. The Stoics thought that was too much. If you aim too high, trying to be happy all the time, trying to be just every fiber of your being having this agreeable feeling or sensation, guess what? You're going to be disappointed. Life isn't like that. In fact, life has unhappiness for everyone. It's happiness for me, it has ha unhappiness in many shapes and forms, but every one of us suffers one unhappiness. So what we should aim for is this inner tranquility, inner peace, and if we can get that, then that's pretty good, and uh, we can get through life uh, pretty well. Ascasis. Here's another word. I think of all the words that are misunderstood, this is probably the word that's the most misunderstood. This is where we get the English word asceticism. And as soon as you start to talk about asceticism, you get wild ideas of, I don't know, monks flagellating themselves or fasting or if you've been to India, the naked fakir who's on the bed of nails all covered in ashes and practicing self-denial, self-mortification. Um, the real, or the better translation of this word is training. And what the Stoics thought, the Stoics thought that life is inevitably hard. The purpose of ascesis or of training or self-denial or if you want self-mortification is that it toughens you up so that when bad things happen in your life, you are tough enough so that they don't knock you off your feet, so you're not uh, uh, completely um, uh, you know, undermined or destroyed, so you don't collapse. Uh, Diogenes, the cynic. Cynics weren't quite Stoics, but they shared many of the same beliefs. Diogenes was a homeless man who lived in Athens. He's the guy that lived in the barrel, and, was, uh, and he was a cynic, which means literally in Greek, the dog. So he was Diogenes the dog. He was seen one time begging from a statue. And uh, the other philosopher asked him, well, what are you doing? You're begging from a statue, you know? Uh, that's crazy, you know, statue can't give you any money. And Diogenes said, I spent my day begging from uh, a statue so I'd get used to being refused. And that's what they mean by training. It's not by, Epictetus says at one point, he says, it's a terrible thing if a man gets everything he wants. A terrible thing. What we need is, we need to practice some kind of self-denial so that we can deal with the difficulties in life. This is the last word, sophos, the Greek word for wise man or wise person. The whole point of the Stoic regime is eventually to be wise. Now it's very difficult to explain exactly what we mean by wisdom. We don't mean that you've memorized a whole bunch of information. We don't mean that you've read a lot of books. Aristotle says the wise person is the person who has kind of the right answer to the big question. But Stoics being a wise person means living accordingly, living to, you know, according to the way uh, things really are. And I want to suggest that liberal arts education, by looking back at theories, at ideas, at arguments, principles, for example, here we're talking about the Stoics, in a way it helps us be wise. It opens our eyes to a much larger picture. It gives us perspective on the world. And I think also the Stoics would certainly um, believe this. 
it has um, a practical application. It has a practical application in that, among other things, it helps us to be dignified and noble and to deal with the adversity, the hardship and the stress that inevitably is a part, it's certainly a part of an undergraduate student's life, but it's a part of any life. And somehow, if we can end up being a sophos or sophos, basically um, we can deal with it uh, in the right way, in a successful way, in an admirable way. Thank you very much.